Well, hey, today we're going to learn about a guy who has a really weird name. His name is Mephibosheth. Yeah, try that. Mephibosheth. Try that fast 10 times. No, we're not going to do that. But he has a really great story, and David, of course, is the hero. So that's what we're talking about today on HC Daily. You're listening to another episode of HC Daily a daily devotional podcast that you can listen to at home or on the go. We believe that you can grow as much as you want to grow spiritually, and this podcast can be a part of your daily growth plan. So, whether you're watching on YouTube, listening on Spotify, or your favorite podcast app, we're glad you're here. Now, let's join our hosts, Jeff Forrester and Chris Zarbaugh in the studio. So, Chris, um, recently I asked you in the in uh, the event of the inevitable movie that's going to be made of your life, who would be the, Again with the, reference the, to that. the main actor? Uh, well, I've just been thinking a lot about this. This has really been amazing. After oh. your answers, it's been fabulous. Wow. Uh, now I'm wondering, what is the title of your biography going to be? Well, actually, uh, it was suggested by my former boss oh, uh-huh. that I write a book about all my zany stories. Uh-huh. And he said, I have the title for you. Okay. And he spelled it out for me. And he, by the way, he said this publicly to thousands of people. Okay. <laughs> he would spell it E F F E D up. E fed up. No, F up. F up. <laughs> but he would spell okay. it E F F E D. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so that's the name of your biography. That yeah, would you not feel be like... my name. No. But that was the name that was suggested well, to what, me. What would your name be? What do you think the name of uh, the title of your biography? Uh, uh, what was Michael Scott's? Uh, Michael Scott's books that he had, uh, how how I managed dot dot dot. <laughs> oh. <laughs> there you go. That's it. Yeah, yeah. How I managed dot oh, dot dot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, boy, that'd be riveting. Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. You might want to stick with the first title. Maybe yeah, that would, yeah. Yeah. Well, it would certainly capture people's attention. The first one would. Yeah. Okay. Well, hey, write the book. Maybe <laughs> all of your fan and uh, enthusiast <laughs> will buy it. So um, we're reading today in Second uh, Samuel chapter nine. And we're reading about this guy named Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth is the son of Jonathan. Remember, Jonathan was David's best friend. Yes. Jonathan was the heir to Saul's throne. He winds up getting killed in battle. Mm-hmm. And um, the story is can be found in 2 Samuel 4.4. 4. Mephibosheth was four years old, five years old. And when his nurse found out that Jonathan had been killed in battle, she fled. She picked him up. But she dropped him. She dropped him. And apparently he broke his back or something because his legs became crippled. Mm-hmm. And so that's how we meet him in this story in right. uh, chapter 9. Well, he's older now. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's many, many years in yeah. between chapter 4 and chapter 9. So right. sometimes you forget that in the Bible. But, yep. Okay. So anyways, here we go. Let's read it. It says, One day David asked, Is anyone in Saul's family still alive? Anyone to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? He summoned a man named Ziba, who had been one of Saul's servants. Are you Ziba? The king asked. Yes, sir, I am, Ziba replied. The king then asked him, is anyone still alive from Saul's family? If so, I want to show God's kindness to them. And Ziba replied, yes, one of Jonathan's sons is still alive. He's crippled in both feet. Where is he? The king asked. In Lodabar, Ziba told him, at the home of Machir, son of Amiel. So David sent for him and brought him from Machir's home. His name was Mephibosheth. He was Jonathan's son and Saul's grandson, and when he came to David, he bowed low to the ground in deep respect. David said, Greetings, Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth replied, I am your servant. Don't be afraid, David said. I intend to show kindness to you because of my promise to your father, Jonathan. I will give you all the property that once belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will eat here with me at the king's table. Mephibosheth bowed respectfully and exclaimed, Who is your servant that you should show such kindness to a dead dog like me? Then the king summoned Saul's servant Ziba and said, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and servants are to farm the land for him to produce food for your master's household. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, will eat here at my table. And Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Ziba replied, Yes, my lord, the king, I am your servant, and I will do all that you have commanded. And from that time on, Mephibosheth ate regularly at David's table like one of the king's own sons. Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah. From then on, all the members of Ziba's household were Mephibosheth's servants. And Mephibosheth, who was crippled in both feet, lived in Jerusalem and ate regularly at the king's table. So here it is, just one more story about David's nobility and his his ability to treat his enemies with uh, kindness and forgiveness. Yeah. 
This is, I, I think, you know, the Bible goes overboard telling all of these stories um, because, it, it, you know, so clearly it's not telling every single event in David's life, but so many events show that David is a noble man. Mm -hmm. He's a good man. He's a good king. And he doesn't just use his power for his own indulgences all the time. He's also looking out for other people. That's why yeah. the people loved him. Yeah. So here's what I feel about this story, uh, because when you read through the book of Second Samuel, if you have ever done that, and you read through it in chronologically, what you see is, is that sometimes when you hear something noble, like, you know, David's showing mercy and grace to, uh, you know, the general, his general, mm -hmm. as, as we talked about last podcast, um, you know, you could almost guess and say, well, you know, he did it because he was noble, but also there was a little bit of a political agenda there, mm -hmm. or maybe he wanted to make a statement to the people, right. you know, even though it wouldn't lessen his heart, you know, and his intent, but still you might think that well, when you get to something like this, here's what, here's what I think. I think <laughs> he's made all the statements he's ever going to yeah, make right. people like he has no reason to do this. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Whereas before you could build a case and said, he has a reason to do this, but, but there's no reason for this. So, which means that you know, it almost seems like the Bible is going overboard to say, no, 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 no. This is who he was. Yeah. Right. And so, the, so this is. Uh, <clears throat> I remember one time I did a series a long, long time ago called "Who You Are When No One's Looking." Mm, yeah. And it was a story. Actually, it was an eight-week series on the life of David. And it was it was the idea that like you know that you should act with integrity when nobody is watching you or when you're by yourself and both the you know rises and falls of David's life. I just remember thinking to myself, man, here's a guy who doesn't have to do anything. And and right here, this shows you like it, nobody was looking at him to do this. Nobody, right. nobody was, he, he just did it because that's who he was. Yeah. You know, I think I, I have a theory. I don't know that I can prove it, but I have a theory. I think that when, um, that who you are when you're younger, as you get older, you become more of who that person is. If you're skeptical and negative, you become more skeptical, more negative, more bitter. If you're the person who goes after revenge when you're younger, you want more of that when you get older, whatever. If Have you ever been around people, though, uh, older people that are just such a joy to be with? They laugh quickly. They're quick to tell a story. They're generous. They're kind. Well, probably they were that way when they were younger, too. They just became more of it. Mm -hmm. um, to the point that, uh, and, and I began to think this back when I used to, I used to volunteer in a, in a ministry that served in nursing homes. We go do services for people in the nursing homes and things, and you get around some people, they're just angry, right? And there'd be other people just so sweet. Nobody knows why they're there, right? And nobody's in their right mind, but you get around some, and they're just so sweet and so kind, and others would be so mean and so grumpy. I just think you become more of what you were when you were younger. I think uh, that's the case often. Yeah. And I think it's the same thing with power. When Power and success. When you become very successful, when you become very powerful, I think you become more of who you were. We tend to be surprised. Wow, success really ruined him. No, that's probably who he really was. Hmm. Wow, you know, he, he was so humble when he was successful. He really became humble the more successful he became. I just think he probably was already humble already, right? And this is one of the reasons why God loved David so much, right? Um, is, is I think this is who David always was, was a good guy. He wanted to do the right thing. And in this one, he'd made a promise to Jonathan. And now finally, here he is, 20 years later, he's able to fulfill it. And he says, I'm going to do it. I, I have all the power. I don't have to. Nobody's around to hold me to this. But I made a commitment to my friend, Jonathan. I'm going to keep it. And I'm going to reach out. And it turns out it's Mephibosheth. Can you imagine being Mephibosheth and getting a call from the king? Mm. <laughs> oh, yeah. scary. Because it was traditional. They would kill every heir yes. to, to a throne that wasn't you know, from their own family. Yeah, that was customary in other nations for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, obviously, David's only the second king of Israel. Right, right. So it wasn't a tradition of Israel, but it was a tradition of kings right. for sure. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, my daughter Tori, uh, when, when she sings on stage... Uh, let me brag on her a little bit. She always has this uh, joyful smile. Yeah, yeah. And everybody always comments on it. You know, when she's working, you know, I, I met her teacher and her her kids. She teaches elementary school, and they always say, man, she just has this smile. She's so pleasant. Um, one time she ran into somebody just recently, and, and they were in line at Chick-fil-A, and she was coming out, and they saw her, and, they, and, and, and she came over, and sh she said hi to the people she knew, and there were some people that didn't know her, and they said, that has to be fake. Like, she's not that nice. Right. Okay. <clears throat> All that to say this, she was that way when she was an infant. 
right? We, we would lay her in her crib. We'd say, it's night, night time now. And she'd say, okay, <laughs> just smile. You know, hey, it's time to get up. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You, you, got, you guys won the cosmic lottery on that one. Well, didn't you? it really, it, it was sort of that way. And, and, uh, and so I can see what you're saying. Uh, you know, somebody carries, and it, we see that at high school reunions. We'll, we'll, we'll get there and we'll say, wow, they're just the same. But at the same time, though, uh, the flip side of that is, is, you know, God can change people. And, uh, you know, people mm-hmm. who are power hungry can learn a very big lesson right. and not be that way. And then uh, some people who are uh, joyful could have their lives, uh, you know, poisoned right. through just the hard knocks of life. That's where I was going to go with that. I think that, you know, when you get to Paul writing uh, in Galatians, he's talking about how the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and gentleness mm-hmm. and kindness and yeah. self-control. Um, God's goal. So our goal for God in our life is to make us happier, to make us uh, more content, to give us more stuff, uh, right? Uh, to keep us safe. That's our goal for God. Yeah, these, these most, God. Most people. These are the things God needs to do for us. But God's goal for us is not comfort always. Mm-hmm. God's goal is that we would change on the inside, that we'd be more loving, more kind, more joyful, more peaceful. And I think that um, that's possible as we surrender to God. If we would focus on the things God focuses on, the reason why David got chosen was because it was on the inside, not the outside. God, Samuel said that. Right. You guys are looking on the outside. God looks on the inside. And this is what we're seeing, is now that David really is this powerful man, he's still a kind, gracious, gentle man. He grieved when his enemies died. He, he, this, this really is who he is. And I think that what we have to do as believers is surrender to the Holy Spirit, let the Holy Spirit keep building this fruit in us, and to stop focusing on, hey, I just want to be comfortable, and instead focus on character. God, make the character of Christ in me, Hmm. right? And I think that the hope for us to really transform our life isn't to try harder to be nicer. It's It's to surrender more to the Holy Spirit and to allow Him to work on those character traits that then hopefully by the time we're those old people or the t- by the time we have all this power, we wind up making good, gracious choices because the people loved David. They were pleased with David because David was this guy. This is, you know, he, he didn't set out to always please the people. He always set out to please God, but the people were pleased because he was the way he was. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and uh, you know, the, the history of the children of Israel have always looked to God, and yet we, we see over and over they forget, then they go back, and then they forget, and God sends, you know, prophets and priests to remind them, and judges, right? Yeah. And uh, and now they have a king. And so David is their constant reminder, which is great. Yeah. Um, you know, somebody, uh, Andy Stanley, I was going to say somebody, but why hide the fact? I, he's my favorite leadership guru guy. Besides? And, and pastor. Besides? No, nah, he trumps you. Me, what? Really? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. In fact, there's like this Gap. Well, you had a good There's run at Heritage. <laughs> <laughs> no, so anyway, so Andy Stanley asked the question, and he, he always says, what story do you want uh, to, to tell, and what story do you want told about you? Yeah. And I, I just love that. You know, every time that you think about your choices, uh, there's so many things that stick out of my mind. You know, whenever you're tempted, you pause, and you think, what's at stake here? You know, my faith is at stake my, with my Heavenly Father, my, my friendships are at stake, my family is at stake to some extent. My future is at stake. And so the, the, the w- another way to say that is to say, what story do you want told about you? And what story do you want to tell to other people? And I think that, uh, you know, David uh, showing kindness to uh, whatever this guy's name is. Mephibosheth. Most, Mephibosheth. Why? Why? Uh, why? Mm-hmm. You know, anyway. Yeah. So, you know, why do that? Jonathan. Jonathan's a great name, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. Mephibosheth. Okay, whatever. Mephibosheth. So anyway, he... Um, uh, you know, treats him that way, and there's no indication that he ever stopped treating him like a royalty. No, no, he treated him like one of his own sons. Yeah, yeah, and and yeah. ate at his table. Yeah, so for the rest of his life. So. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So um, there, there's a note in the um, what is this? Life application. Life application. Bible? I always forget the name of it. I love it. It's my favorite one. I was just I can't remember the name. So uh, in the notes for verses five and six, which five and six are talking about how he sends for Mephibosheth, and Mephibosheth comes in and he's terrified of the king, right? Mm-hmm. The note says, Mephibosheth was afraid to visit the king who wanted to treat him like a prince. Although Mephibosheth feared for his life and may have felt unworthy, David wanted to honor him and show him the love and loyalty he'd promised to Jonathan. When God graciously offers us forgiveness of sins and eternal life, we may feel unworthy, but God shows us this grace out of love for us. 
a reception even warmer than the one David gave Mephibosheth awaits for all who receive God's gift through trusting Jesus Christ, not because we deserve it, but because of what God has promised. That's right? amazing. And so David was acting like God. And those are the most memorable moments in your life. The stories, the best stories that could ever be told about you is when people start thinking of when you acted like God or when you acted like Jesus in their life, right? When you did those best things, it doesn't make sense. No, no other king in David's era would have done this um, except the king of kings. Mm -hmm. And so when he emulated them, that just stood out because the whole, everybody else went, nobody does this. Why did you do that? Mm -hmm. And the people love him. Yeah. And, and I love how he looked at Mephibosheth and said, don't be afraid. Yeah. I intend to show you kindness. So I was thinking about uh, when you were just reading just now, I thought to myself, that reminds me of a song that I love and I've sang before on stage. I'm not going to sing it, but rather just read the lyrics. But uh, have you ever heard the song called This One's With Me? Yes, that's a great and, song. And by New Song. Yep. And, and so the first verse says, I was dreaming about heaven, dreamed I was standing at the pearly gates. We were all there and I was so scared in the presence of one so great. Talking about, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. his heavenly father. He said, I felt so worried and un um, I felt so worried and unworthy. I felt like running away. I bowed my head and I turned to go when I heard someone say, Father, this one's with me, part of the family. One of the reasons why I died on Calvary. Father, welcome him in. I paid the price for him. Father, oh, Father, this one's with me. Mm, that's a good one. And, and you know, I, I, I just love that because... I'm sure you've been in a situation where you were allowed in somewhere that you shouldn't be allowed in oh, sure. because you were with the company of somebody really important. Right, right. And he says, this one's with me. Yeah. You know, and then, and you know, for, for him to say, I, I'm so unworthy in the presence of a holy God, I go to turn away. That's accurate. Yeah. You know, and then, and then he says, father, this one's with me. And so then the rest of the song goes on and says, heavenly father said, well, come on in, mm. you know, you're with my son. It's so, great. So that's what you see. I think for many of us, we feel, like something in us is broken, mm. like uh, we we can't get there on our own. We don't deserve to be in front of the king. We kind of feel like probably we should be punished. And instead he uh, graciously opens up and says, no, I want you to sit at my table. I want you to be like one of my sons, mm. right? This is all of the things that God does through Jesus for us is seen in this story with Mephibosheth. We're Mephibosheth. We're broken. We're broken by sin. Mm. Um, we're the ones who deserve punishment. Uh, we're the ones that have no nothing to offer the king, and for some reason the king loves us, and he keeps his promises through Jesus to us and sets us at the table and uh, treats us like a son. Yeah, and, and he does it not because of us, but because of something else. Because he's good. Right, well, because he's good, but then yeah. also it says he did it because of the promise he made to Jonathan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, so there was a promise kept uh, because, you know, so, so he's on the benefiting end of somebody else's sacrifice, right? Somebody else's promise, right? And that's that's a parallel too, isn't it? Yeah. So God shows us mercy because you know Jesus Christ came, died on the cross, you know, and the promise was made to us. You know, if we just simply believe and trust in Him, we'll have a home in heaven. So that's why the heavenly Father loves us, right? So David's not a perfect guy, right? But man, David is one of those people we can look to and go, when he's at his best. We should all aspire to be that kind of guy. Yeah, and and it's also it's also a beautiful picture of a foreshadowing of 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 you know our standing with God through Christ today, yeah. mm -hmm. yep. which is great. Well, that's a great place to end it. I think. I think so too. All right. Well, we will see you next time. Thank you for joining us today. If you enjoyed this podcast, please help us spread the word by liking this episode and sharing it on your social media platforms. Be sure to leave a comment and review, and don't forget to give us five stars. When you do, you help us reach even more people who need a daily devotional like HC Daily. If you'd like to hear more from Chris and Jeff, they're both teaching pastors at Heritage Church, located in Southeast Michigan. You can get more of their messages by clicking on the Messages tab at heritagechurch.com. Be sure to join us again soon for another episode of HC Daily.